Thank you for the warm welcome. Can everyone hear me all right, first of all? Okay, good. All right, the one part that Billy left out of my introduction was that I am now a visiting professor at Vanderbilt, but I'm also working at the Naval Observatory. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Naval Observatory as my talk progresses, um, because it will be intertwined with uh, what we do there. Um, and um, I have um, been very happy to be back at Vanderbilt, um, and they created a way for me to come back about three years ago, and I have no intention of leaving anytime soon, but I'm still at the Naval Observatory. Um, Naval Observatory is, has the um, honor of being the oldest continuous government institution in service, so I figured it was a pretty safe place to work, um, and um, so I'm still working there as I'm visiting at Vanderbilt. But it, the, um, it has given me the opportunity to bring the Navy's projects to Vanderbilt, and Vanderbilt has supplied us with lots of wonderful uh, students to work on our projects. So what I'm going to tell you today are the results of some of this work that we've had the past three years. Okay, so tonight's talk is on celestial navigation. The Naval Observatory is the place for celestial navigation in uh, the U.S. We partner with our equivalent office in the United Kingdom, and the two of us together uh, put out publications for celestial navigation. But before I talk about celestial navigation, we need to set the stage. We have to talk about celestial dynamics. Celestial dynamics is the branch of astronomy that celestial navigation falls under. Um, and we're going to start, it might sound a little bit um, a difficult topic, but we're going to start simple and then work up from there. You experience celestial dynamics every day. The Earth is rotating. That is part of celestial dynamics. Um, it rotates eastward. So um, the way you can remember that is think about the way the space shuttles were launched on the east coast over the ocean. The reason they do that is they don't have to fight the rotation of the Earth. When you fly from New York to Los Angeles, it takes a little bit longer than when you fly from Los Angeles to New York, and that's because you're going with rotation versus against rotation. So in any case, you are rotating every day. Does anyone know approximately how fast you're traveling if you're standing at the equator, roughly? You're perfectly right, yes. About 1,000 miles an hour, very good. Now, if you're standing higher up, like where we are, are we going faster or slower? Very good, so a little bit slower. Distance equals rate times time, so you have less distance to cover at the latitudes that aren't at the equator. At the equator, you're going to be hitting your maximum distance. Now, the distance is constant, right? But the time and the velocity is not. That varies. How do we measure that? Well, luckily, there's people at the Naval Observatory that are looking at stars, or sorry, they're looking at radio um, sources that are extremely, extremely far away. They're so far away that they're relatively stable. So they're using interferometers at our observatory out in Flagstaff, Arizona to measure these uh, things, and they can time the Earth as they, as they spin. So every once in a while, we issue a leap second. Have you ever um, heard of leap seconds when they happen? Those are issued from the Naval Observatory. The Earth is slowing down a little bit. So every once in a while, we want our clock on our wrist to match the sun, so we, keep, uh, we issue leap seconds. So that is one service that your government is doing for you, is keeping track of how fast we are rotating. Okay? And that's your first lesson in celestial dynamics today. All right, so let's take it up a notch. Whoops. Oh, sorry, I should have put this up. This is actually your first lesson in celestial navigation. Okay, so from our perspective on the Earth, this is what the rotation looks like. Okay, what direction do you think this person is looking? West. Very good. The Earth rotates eastward, so we th see things rise in the east and set in the west. And that is very basic celestial navigation. All righty. So, next step. The Earth is also orbiting. We're orbiting the sun. Uh, it, is not, it is not pulling on the equator. Here's our equator. It is pulling on the ecliptic. The ecliptic is, is the plane that all the planets 
are basically orbiting in, orbiting around the sun. So it pulls at this angle. Um, the, the north rotation axis, the axis of rotation, the north end and the south end, they're tilted a bit, about 23.5 degrees. This is called the obliquity. And as it pulls, it is pulling from the center, but it's, but it's pulling us at an angle. So we're tilted and it's pulling along here. Um, and the speed that we're cruising around the sun every year is about 67,000 miles per hour. Okay, so you, if you have a bad day and you think you didn't do anything during the day, you've actually really traveled a lot. So um, now this here, that's the average speed. That's the speed it would be if we were in a circular orbit, but we're not. We're in an elliptical orbit. So we're a little bit closer here than here. So we're actually traveling, traveling a lot faster when we're here than we're here. So I love to tell my, ask my students this. They say, I always say, which, is, which do you think summer, which is summer and which is winter? And they always pick here. Because they think, oh, we're closer to the sun. I mean, sorry, summer in the northern hemisphere. They'll say, oh, we're closer to the sun. That's actually not right. Our nor northern hemisphere summer is actually here. And the reason is the tilt. We get more direct sun rays. Now, the opposite is true for Australia. Their summer's here. And they say that's why the skin cancer rates are worse in Australia, because they're getting direct sunlight and they're close. So anyway, this is all dynamics. Again. The Naval Observatory looks at things very far away that don't move throughout the year um, to track this speed and to track this path. And this is another, um, let me see if I can do this right. This is something I love to show my students too because, let's see, hopefully this won't. When you usually see this orbit illustrated, there's usually a path drawn. There's actually not a path that we're following. There's not a road. We're just hurtling through space. And I always tell my students, so here's your faraway things that we're looking at every day to track our road. Celestial dynamics makes the road, okay? It's, that's, that's what happens. So when we're rotating, we're rotating the same direction as the sun. This is called prograde rotation because we're going the same. Let me see if I can do this again. We're going the same. Oops. Escape. Yeah. Where is he? But, there we go. It's hard to do backwards. Okay, sorry. So this is going, this is called prograde rotation where we are, our, rot our rotation is in the same uh, direction as our orbit. There's only two planets that don't do it that way. It's Venus and Uranus uh, rotate opposite of their orbit. But this is all celestial dynamics. Okay. So, get back over here. All right. All right. So, there's also one finer thing that celestial uh, mechanics uh, researchers look at when it comes to the Earth. It's called precession and nutation. You probably these are the ones you probably have not looked heard about before, but maybe you had. Um, there's there is some changes, small changes, and long-term changes to the axis of rotation of the Earth. So think of it like this. Um, precession can best be described as, uh, and the analogy that I always like to use is um, if you have a top and you wind up your top and the top goes like this as it rotates. That's the same thing that's happening on the Earth. Because of our obliquity, the fact that we're tilted 23.5 degrees, the planets and the sun are trying to drag the Earth back into the ecliptic. So it's this gravitational torque on the rotation axis. This has a period of 26,000 years that it goes around the top. So the North Star is somewhere up here, Polaris, the North Star. But in 14,000 AD, Vega is going to be our North Star. So just remember, it's not static. And if, you, and if you really do some accurate uh, looking at Polaris, Polaris isn't exactly at zero right now either, but it's 
the closest in vicinity. So a while ago, Polaris was not the North Star. So this goes around every 26,000 years. And this is important for navigation because you need to know where your north is. So it's very accurately kept, um, this, the position of this. Now there's another fine mo movement. This is called nutation. Um, that period is about 19, a little less than 19 years. So it's a very, a very um, shorter period, but the effect is not as great. Um, it's, it's something on the order of 9 or 10 arc seconds, which is a tiny unit, but it's this wobble. That is caused by the moon. Um, it's caused by the moon pulling on the, it's a tidal pull on the bulge of the Earth. Um, the moon's orbit isn't exactly always in the same plane, so that's what creates this mutation. So both of, both of those things are going on with dynamics as well. The reason I'm telling you all this is that I want you to, to get the idea, and I think you probably already knew this before you came in here, that um, the, our observation platform is a moving platform. So anything we observe is going to have to have a time related to it, because everything's moving. Okay. Now what I'm going to tell you though now, that we understand that, is that the things we're observing are also moving. Okay, so not only is our platform moving, but dynamicists also have to deal with moving objects. Now, I'm just not talking about the, the moving from our perspective, not just because we're moving, they're moving, but they're actually moving, okay? Including our star is also moving. But anyway, all these other stars and everybody is moving. So, for example, say the star has some velocity, this red arrow. That's its true velocity. It's just moving. It's cruising along. It's, it's attracted by something near it. Or maybe it has another star next to it that's revolving around in this long-term thing. So it has some sort of velocity. What we observe from Earth, we call proper motion. That's its change in uh, two directions, the longitudinal direction and the uh, vertical direction over time. So this will have some time component with it. What we measure is a transverse velocity across the sky, and then we'll measure the radial velocity, which is back and forth. The easier, it, both these two components separate can get uh, true velocity. Now, um, the radial velocity is measured on spectra. I don't know if you've ever heard of measuring spectra. It's just like a chemical spectra you'll see it shifting, because if it's coming at you or away from you, you'll see it shifting. And it'll either shift to the red if it's going away from you, because it's getting longer wavelengths, or it's shifting towards blue. Usually everything's shifting, most often red, because things are moving away from each other, but sometimes they're shifting blue, too. Um, so anyway, this is very hard to measure because things are inclined at all different angles and you don't, if something, you don't really get the true velocity all of it unless it's coming right at you at 90 degrees and that often doesn't happen. But anyway, I wanted to show you this. This is um, the Gaia astrometric satellite. So astrometry, which always corrects, autocorrects spell checks to astronomy, it's very annoying. But this is an actual verb, it's also a noun. But astrometry is the measurement of the positions and motions of celestial bodies. So in celestial dynamics, the main thing we do is make astrometric predictions. All that's saying is we figure out where things are going to be at a given time. Say 100 years from now, where's this thing going to be? We do astrometry. We, we predict it out. It's all math. We just predict it out. So last week I was in this conference where this was released. This is the latest and greatest astrometric satellite. It predicts that it's going to take the, uh, get astrometry for 147 billion stars. And it is orders of magnitude better than anything we've had before. It's it's precise to 10 milliarc seconds, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's called the Gaia Astronomical Satellite, and I'm going to show you what they released when I was there because it's mesmerizing. Um, oh, let's see how I get this. Oh, I want this play. There. Thank you. 
There we go. It takes a minute to load. Okay, so what you're going to see is astrometry for two, about two million, sorry, 20 million, two million stars um, progressing out over a series of 750 years in each frame. Okay, what are we doing here, guys? Maybe I'll try this again. Does it stall? Try it again. Okay. Up here. Oh, shoot. Is it page? That? There we go. Let's try this. Okay. This is worth it because it's so cool. Okay. So this is, these are results from the Gaia satellite. Um, and what they've done is fed in their fancy astrometry, and they are putting each frame is 750 years. Now, if this doesn't convince you that stars have intrinsic motion, I don't know what will. You can see that stars are migrating. What they found is, is that stars, this is the plane of the galaxy, and the stars migrate out of the plane of the galaxy. So everything's moving. This is why I have a job right here. <laughs> Everything's moving. <laughs> so we have to figure out where those things are going to be, when they're going to be. Down here, I think the Pleiades cluster was down here and it was cruising along. I saw someone else had a closer view of this. You could see it better, but um, you can pick out several. There's several binaries that I, I looked in here to find them orbiting around each other. But um, you can go to, if you Google um, Gaia, uh, Gaia, G-A-I-A, astrometry, astrometry satellite. This is on the public page. You can see it. So they just released this last week. Do you know how long it took them to hmm? this simulation? How long it took them to do the simulation? simulation? That I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So this is one million, one and a half million, almost two million years from now. So. Go back over here. All right. Are they taking into account dark matter separating, like the expansion of the universe? Well, that will play into it. They're getting the coordinates of the stars themselves, but they're using those to study dark matter. There's a lot of dark matter studies coming from this data because it can be measured so much fine. In fact, the peep, some of the people there that I met were studying the finer parts of the theory of gravitation. So they think this satellite will come up with a, a broader theory of, for gravitation. So it's going to be lots of different um, results from it. So I've hoped this is my end of my talk on dynamics, my introduction of dynamics. And now we can talk about celestial navigation because everyone now has learned that our platform is moving, our objects that we're observing are moving, and they all need a time associated with them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about celestial navigation, looking to the stars in the age of modern navigation. Okay, so everyone, before about an hour ago, it was a very bad time to talk about celestial navigation being a viable method for navigation because of the weather. Celestial navigation does not work with bad weather, unfortunately. Huge drawback. But s picture yourself on a wide open ocean and you are far from any signal. Your GPS does not work. What are you going to do? If you have to, if you know, or, or out in a desert, you're in a, in a desert and you've run out of gas, and you know your gas station is west, first thing you're going to do, hopefully, is look for maybe the glow from the setting sun, west, east. Okay, but if you're a little more skilled and you know you have to go north, you're going to look for Polaris. Okay, can anyone find it in this picture? I bet you can. Right there? Let's see if you're correct. Yes, you're correct. The way I usually find it is I go to the Big Dipper, and it flares out of the Big Dipper. It's the tail of the Small Dipper, a little sorry, the Little Dipper, but it's so hard to see all the stars in, this, in, the, little, in the Little Dipper. So, celestial navigation. I call this more celestial orientation because you're trying to just find direction. You're not finding your exact location, but you all can do celestial navigation that way. What about though? if you're below the equator. 
and it's set. Do you know how to find? Does anyone know how to find the sun? We actually get calls at the observatory from navigators on ships from the Navy that have crossed for the first time, and they say, hey, how do you find the South Pole? They don't know because they're all always in the Northern Hemisphere. So we finally, this page is actually taken from the, um, the lesson I put together for the Navy sailors. So I just lifted it right out of there. So this is how we teach them what direction is south. Okay, so if you're even down in Florida or Texas, um, at the southern, southern part of the U.S., you can see the Southern Cross. It's south of South 35, it's always above the horizon. So if you're, if you're in the in-between those parts, you'll have to wait for it to rise. But um, you, you can see it. And the way you find it are these two bright, bright stars, um, Alpha and Beta Centauri. They're the closest star system to us. So they're pretty bright. And they line up like this. And then the Southern Cross is here. And you just take it down to the pole. And then this goes down to the horizon. So you kind of have to draw a line between the top two. Um, if it's standing up, if the cross is actually standing up straight, it points straight down to it. Okay, that sounds easy in my diagram, but let's try to do it. <laughs> you see it? The way that it's, here's your pointer stars. The problem is this is in the plane of the galaxy, so it's very crowded. And this is actually, the reason I'm showing this slide too is this is a problem with celestial navigation because when you're out in the very dark ships, those bright stars get um, lost. When we're sitting in Washington trying to do this, we have no problem seeing the bright stars. But there, it's, it's hard. Now, the Southern Cross is here. The Europeans named it a cross. The, um, some of the um, original um, South American populations thought this was an arrow. But it became a cross when the Europeans called it a cross. So in this case, here's Alpha Beta, Beta Centauri and the cross, the Southern, southern Pole is somewhere down there. So it's almost directly south. Okay, so now that we've oriented ourselves, let's get a little more difficult because you all look really smart that you can figure this out. This is, we're going to start talking about if you don't want to just orient yourself, but you want to find your location. How do you do it? Okay, the first key is to understand the concept of a GP. GP is, your, is a geographical position of a celestial body. And how you find the GP is very easy. Pretend your celestial body, or whatever you're looking at to navigate by, has a string falling down on it on the Earth. Where it hits the Earth is that body's GP. Okay? So that's, that object will be directly on top of your head, the highest point in the sky. So you're standing at its GP. So here it's illustrated as the sun's GP. Here's a little thing. So the sun has, emits the light onto the earth. The center of that would be a GP. Now the GPs move, obviously. The sun, uh, sun's GP travels a mile every four seconds. That's how fast the GPs are moving of bodies. So you'd have to run pretty fast to keep up with the sun's GP. Now I'm going to do a shout out to our eclipse coming up because this is another way to visualize a GP. This is the shadow of, that the Earth is creating from lining up with the sun behind it. Sorry, thank you, the moon. <laughs> the moon standing on it. Now this isn't precisely the GP because you can see there's a little angle coming in here, the shadow is coming at an angle. It was coming in directly at 90 degrees. That would be the sun's GP and the moon's GP at the same time actually. Um, but this, this shadow will move across as the Earth rotates. Um, this, the angle of the sun, this is almost equal to what it's going to be when um, we have our eclipse on the 21st. It's going to be about 61 degrees in the altitude from Nashville. So it's not going to be directly overhead, but it's going to be about an angle. So, but think of GP when you think of that. It's the... Okay, so... We're going to get a little farther here. So visualize yourself standing at the GP of some star, body, sun, or whatever. Let's call this star A. It's a little mangled there. Star A. So if you're standing at the GP of star A, star A is at your zenith. Zenith is just 90 degrees above your head. Okay? That's the, the astronomical term for zenith. 
your latitude on the Earth, on the terrestrial sphere, on the Earth, is equal to star A's declination. Your longitude on the Earth is equal to the star A's GHA. Okay, I just said two words. You have no idea what they are. Declination is equivalent to latitude in the skies. It's the coordinate that goes up and down. It's just on the celestial sphere. GHA is equivalent to longitude. It changes, obviously, right? It has a time associated because it changes all the time. Both declination and GHA are calculated. And they're online, but they're put out in books. GHA and declination for celestial bodies are all put in books like this for people to look up. This happens to be for this year, 2017. These change all the time, but all the brightest things to navigate by, we got coordinates for. So if you happen to be standing at a GP and you know your time and you know a body that was on top of your head, you could find your latitude and longitude. You could figure it out by just finding the star, the star, the body's coordinates in here. That's celestial navigation. Simple as pie, right? But what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to be staying at the GP. Well, we try. I mean, here's the 57 brightest stars. There's a good distribution of them. They're all around, but you see some holes. <laughs> so there's a lot of holes, just, just a couple of holes. So those actually, these are the brightest, 57 brightest stars in the sky. There's a little handout in the front of which ones those are that we maintain for. So there's a trick for celestial navigation because you're probably not going to be standing under a GP at any given time. Okay, so here comes the tricky part. What you have to do, basically, you're standing at some distance from a star's GP. The key is to figure out that distance. How far am I from that GP? And how you do that is you find the altitude to that star off the horizon. And through some math and spherical trig and all that, you can figure out your position from that GP and hence your position on the Earth. So what you'll get is a circle out of that. Because you're not standing precisely at it, you're just going to get an estimate. Anywhere you're standing on that circle, you're going to measure that star at the same altitude. So it doesn't narrow, it narrows it down some. But it doesn't, it gives you a, a circle, but you know, you know where you are generally, but um, one's not going to be enough. Let me first tell you how you measure the altitude. This is called a sextant, and it has two mirrors. It has a horizon mirror, it has a horizon mirror and a index mirror. The index mirror is what you acquire the star in. So when you look through it, there's a split screen. There's, there's a, here's the um, index mirror, and this is the horizon mirror. So this will, you set this one on the horizon, and the other one you set on the star, whatever body you're trying to find the angle of, and you move it until the body lines with the horizon. And that's how you measure the altitude of the body. I'll pass this around if you want to look at it real quick. Here's the mirrors. Um, It's, it, you can't really understand it until you actually do it. It's very um, difficult to figure out. This one actually doesn't have a second mirror. You just have to line up the side with the horizon and then the star or whatever you're looking at in there. But it works pretty good. Or, sorry, pretty well. Okay, so let's get back to our problem here. We only knew, in the first example, we only knew our, our position to a circle. Okay? We've got to narrow it down more. So what do we do? We take more altitudes of other bodies. And usually, so in this example, this person looks at star A, here's the light from star A coming down, and they measure the altitude A. After they do the math, that gives them a circle with a radius of, to the GP of that star A. Okay, so they, they, they know they're anywhere on that circle. Then they turn around backwards, and they find another star, star B. And they measure the angle to star B, do some math, and they figure out that they could be anywhere on this circle. And guess what? Those two circles intersect at C and D, or near C and D. 
So now they've narrowed their position down. It could be at C or D. So what, if you only have two sources, you'll say, ah, I think I knew where my last position was and I was walking this fast, so I think I'm closer to C than D. So let's say I'm at C. How to narrow this down even more is to take more altitudes. Normally, we would want to take at least three. Okay, and so this is what it looks like on an old-fashioned, pl actually plotting out celestial navigation. What you'll see is that you'll have, this is three observations. We've got Spica, Danube, I think Doobie, I'm not sure what that one says, and then, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to look over here. Altair. Altair, thank you. My eyes aren't good. These lines are the actual circles of position. But locally, you can make them lines. So where these lines, these three lines cross, you'll get this position. Somewhere in that little circle you could be. The other set of lines, you'll notice, let's look at Spica. Here's its line and circle of position, line segment. You can see here's the, dis the direction to its GP, to Spica's GP. So you usually when you plot, you'll have the radius line, and then you'll have the line from the circle. So it gets a little messy, and sometimes it's easier if you have the students use colored, different colored pencils to kind of keep them, keep them out, but that's how you learn, um, learn how to do it. So that's finding your position with three. Now, the Navy doesn't use pencil and paper anymore. Thank goodness. They would be very confused. We make them learn with pencil and paper, but they use a program that we um, created at, we maintain at the Naval Observatory called Stella. So what they have to do, all they have to do, is go out and measure the altitudes and some errors. And then they feed it in, and it automatically plots. You can see they have a lot of plots, on the, a lot of sites on this one. Um, Sirius, they even did the moon, the lower limb of the moon. They did Jupiter. And the program actually knows how fast they're going and knows where they're going to be and knows what time they want to take their observations and it plots out the best stars to look at or the best bodies to look at in advance. And you see this little um, dot there with a circle and within a dot or dot within a circle? That is, um, that indicates that was a GPS fix. That's a sign for GPS. So this was the GPS fix and what they're doing is a redundant check on that. So thank goodness it lies within the same, they agree. Um, as you can see, the accuracy is much uh, less than the GPS fix. So. What are those dimensions of uncertainty in that? Oh, in the, in the site? Yeah. Uh, that has to do with the uncertainty in the method. Right, so in practice, you might be a few miles, you might need mm -hmm. something. So that's pretty Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second, the best you can do, yeah. Okay, so um, I wrote this down here because I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, the navigation team, uh, on, the, um, on a ship, uh, the navigation team consists of about four or five uh, off, uh, navigators, depending on the size of the ship. The officers on the ship are no longer, uh, 1997, no, yeah, 1997, they stopped teaching officer celestial navigation because GPS was all the, you know, the rage. So... This year, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, they started teaching officers celestial navigation again, which we're very excited about. So the Navy is uh, recognizing that celestial navigation uh, is important as a, re as a redundant backup to GPS. They're doing some more advanced um, development as well. They're doing something called automated celestial navigation, where you're not going to get sailors taking the, the altitude measurements. You're actually going to be having cameras taking the altitude measurements uh, automatically and doing the reductions themselves very quickly. So this is going to change some things. It automates the observations. They're also doing day and night capability in the infrared. So you can actually do celestial navigation in the day if you're using infrared. You can see stars in the day with infrared sensors. So this changes things a, uh, a bit. Um, they're also doing things with pattern recognition. And that's not using, that's I guess you could technically call it celestial navigation, but it's not a fix like I've been describing. It's actually um, recognizing, taking a shot of several star, star pattern and comparing it to every known pattern and figuring out where they are from those patterns. And it's just like Star Trek. That's how Star Trek navigated, apparently. 
I might be wrong, but that's, I think, how that's Star Trek. So that's how they were describing it. So in all of this description, um, I hope that you have realized that it is very important for the accuracy of these uh, methods, especially now that we're changing to camera recognition, to have precise positions of your map, of your background stars, the things that you're, you're observing and comparing to, need to be precise. Um, I looked at this problem with a student recently because we were looking at we were looking at those 57 navigation stars, the ones I showed you on the globe. What's that? Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Somewhat, is it possible that you might get incorrect readings if, like, they're moving? And so you might not get the same as what you might have, like, gotten three years ago? Right. You're in that same spot? Oh, yeah, yeah. But we have to, we will know where that's going to be. We use our prediction methods, which is all math, and figure out where it's going to be. That's why time is so important, too. You have to get a really precise time to know. Um, so if you don't know exactly where your star is going to be, you might have error in your navigation. So the 57 navigation stars, there's actually a lot more navigation stars than this, but these are the traditional 57 brightest. A large portion of them are binary stars. Now binary stars are two stars that are orbiting around each other. Some have periods of very small, some have periods up to hundreds of years. But wide binaries have longer periods of time and I was looking at the wide binaries in those navigation stars because I'm thinking alright if we're going to be looking this not with our eyeballs, our eyeballs are resolving a star pair like this, this is about five degree, or sorry five arc seconds across the separation our eyeballs will see this as one when we're taking our sight with our altitude but if a camera is doing it and the camera doesn't know you know about which, which one do I choose so if the cameras chose the wrong star in doing this, how would that affect the, um, the solution, the navigation solution? How would that affect your position? And I looked in the literature, and no one had really done this before because they haven't had this, this hasn't come up before. So I had the student do the worst case scenario of someone choosing the wrong star and being on that spot on the earth which it was the worst because when you're observing binary stars the separation is different no matter depending on where you are on the globe so I had that student find the the worst case scenario we like worst case scenarios to look at them seeing how bad it is and and so say your camera chose the wrong star Well, what came out of this is this this is the Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B over a period of a hundred years this is the error in the navigation solution on this side so it depends on which year. So obviously about 2060, if you chose the wrong star then, you're going to have a worst case scenario as you know, some, something you know, down in 2040. It's all due to the orientation of this rotating system and how far apart we're observing it, the separation. So notice it's about 450 meters error if you chose the wrong star. Now this is saying something too about the, just the position. Say you just weren't picking the wrong binary or the wrong star in a binary pair. If your position was just off initially by some factor, this is indicative of what kind of error you'd get on, the, on your navigation solution. So 450 meters. So keep that in mind. Because I'm going to tell you how good you can actually get. And I think this was related to your question before. The drawbacks to sl traditional celestial navigation not the newer methods I was telling you about, but traditional celestial navigation. The best you can do is about 370 meters. So when you, when you, when you figure the worst case scenario for the, for the binaries in the traditional sense was 450, now that might, we still don't know yet about the new systems because we just, we just haven't gotten there yet, but it's a benchmark. So in practice, if you get between um, a half, and 1.5 nautical miles, um, that is really good. So that is really good. I've tried celestial navigation on a destroyer with the navigation team, and we got 2.1 nautical miles, and they were jumping around. They thought it was the best thing that ever happened. 
Like, this is great. Um, so drawbacks is, it's low accuracy. It's weather dependent, as we've already said, and it has a high learning curve. You can't really learn it until you do it, honestly. Um, however, it's independent of ground aids, aids or infrastructure. It does not cost any money to maintain the stars. They are free. You can't take them out. Okay? Has global coverage. There are some holes, but there's global coverage. It cannot be jammed. No one can jam the signals. And it does not give any off any signals that can be detected by an enemy. Okay? It's natural. So let's compare what I just told you to the thing that you all know everything about, which is GPS. Or, sorry, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. GPS is just one of a GNSS system. Now, instead of stars, we're replacing the stars with fast-moving satellites. The satellites are the stars. And the method is somewhat the same. It's doing triangulation, just like celestial navigation, but it's fast-moving satellites that are giving off signals that we can see through the clouds. Okay, so this slide's a little bit old, but a couple years, maybe about two or three years old. But this is, let's just look at the precision. So the one we all know is GPS. Um, Navstar GPS is, is uh, maintained by the U.S. Precision five meters. Compare that to the precision of Celestial Nav. Galileo is the European Union's set. It is presently uh, functioning. It is, um, but it's having problems. They're running a lot of tests in it right now and, um, and launching satellites. It's coming up to speed, but it's not there yet. Russia has GLONASS. Um, it has it has quite a bit of problems. Um, and the other two uh, in China and India are um, just regional over their countries. So we could not access those. So there are other systems besides GPS. It's getting, it's, it's kind of crowded um, up there, but this is how they're working. So GNSS, this is how it works. It's a lot um, like celestial navigation, but with electronic means. Um, you have your space segment of your satellites. You have your receivers. You're all familiar with your receivers. You have them on your cell phones and other things. The control segments may be one thing that you hadn't heard before. Um, the control seg segment uploads the time to the satellites. Remember, we need time. Time is the, third, the, the other part of the navigation. Um, you need to know what time it was, where it was. And this is fed up um, from, from the satellite, or to the satellites from a system of cesium fountain clocks that are extremely, extremely accurate. They are kept in a windowless building in the Naval Observatory in Washington. And I think there's four of them, and they average together their time, and then they beam it up to the satellites, to the GPS. And this is what I say is the reason we probably have this, this tight security at the Naval Observatory, because this is what's happening there with the time. Um, so, the GPS was designed. Why that's not rotating? It's not. I don't think this is going to work. Nope. Okay, this is supposed to rotate, but it's not. So the GPS is designed to always have six satellites at a time over your head as it rotates. This is an illustration of somewhere in out west, and they have, they have six. This is supposed to rotate, and it will show you it has, as one drops off, another one picks up. Um, four satellites are needed for a position fix with GPS. So you have some spares, usually, that, can fall to, that you can use. Um, around the poles, there's not as much coverage, because there's just sometimes not enough satellites in that area um, to get a good fix. So there are drawbacks to GPS and GNSS. Um, the vulnerabilities, as, it, as technology has caught up with it, there's been vulnerabilities in GPS. Um, there's things called multipath, which happen in urban canyons, where if you're down or in a real canyon or an urban canyon with lots of buildings around you, uh, you, lose, you can lose your signal or your signal can get reflected off of things. Um, there's segment errors. This just happened to Galileo system uh, this, this past year, where I told you they have to upload the things to the satellites. They had a problem with one of their uploads, and the whole thing went offline. Um, there's interference with, with GNSS. 
intentional and unintentional. Um, I can tell you one of each example. Uh, one of the first times the vulnerabilities came to light was from a British um, bomber that was off the coast of Turkey. And there was a signal coming out of an illegal broadcast off the coast of Turkey. And they were supposed to bomb and, uh, somewhere, and it was telling them that they were supposed to bomb. And they said, are you sure? Are you sure? It's not, it's not right. So it was interfering unintentionally with what they were doing. And, and that's when everyone started saying, oh, maybe something bad. Maybe we need to look at this. Um, now, in intentional interference happens quite a bit off the coast of um, Korea as the pilots are coming in into Japan. Um, that happens. Spoofing, I think, is the most scariest thing, I think, to me that I hear about. Um, spoofing is actually where you think it's working, and it's, and it's not. Spoofing is usually always um, someone trying to do something not nice and um, making it, uh, making your, what you're piloting do something else. For example, um, there was in a drone recently that was spoofed, um, I think in northern China, around the Korea area. It was, it was spoofed and it was brought down um, by GPS spoofing. There's also, I hear of things of, um, I heard of a yacht that got spoofed and they made it drive somewhere else and so someone could possess that yacht. Where the whole time they thought they were on a different path and then they arrived somewhere else. Now, the name of the game is the more secure your um, GPS receivers are to spoofing, the bigger they are. So right now the technology, the smaller the vehicle, say the, if you have a drone or something like that, it can't handle heavy equipment. So the GPSs are less secure, the devices are less secure, the smaller they go. Technology is catching up. But recently when I heard that Amazon Prime or Amazon was going to be delivering packages by GPS on these little drones, I thought, oh boy, here we go. You know, these things are not heavy enough and there's going to be a new wave of crimes of people spoofing and coming right to their house. Anyway, so my point in this whole slide is that GPS is vulnerable. Um, the last thing I did, the one I didn't talk about was atmospheric um, interference. Since this is an astronomy lecture, let's spend some time, let's spend a second on this. This happens in the ionosphere of the atmosphere. Um, when the sun has a coronal mass ejection, it sends out charged particles. And this all, often happens, this is, comes, emanates from sunspots. Charged particles come out. When it gets stuck in the atmosphere, or sorry, in the ionosphere part of the atmosphere, what can happen is interference and turbulence. So you'll either get um, scintilla scintillations that will uh, mess up your ranging, so that's the timing, so it'll tell you the wrong time and it won't work as well, or it, you'll actually lose the signal altogether, the loss of lock. I don't know if you've ever been driving down the street and if you have a satellite radio, your satellite radio goes out and then your phone goes out at the same time. It's probably during, if you look up on the space weather site, maybe it's a, something, but my things all tend to go out at the same time. It's probably a, a coronal mass ejection event that's happening. So it affects GPS as well. Now they try to model this, but it's very hard to model. But they've done it here. It varies as the sunspot number. So obviously if it's coming from sun, th these sunspots, it's going to happen more when there's higher sunspot number. They looked at this um, during uh, Solar Max back in 2013 and tried to model it. I think this Air Force did this. Um, and they tried to um, model when and, when and where it was going to potentially happen. And they came up with this. Um, obviously the red marks the areas that was more frequent. Um, up to 100 events per year where this, uh, this, um, these events happened, where the bubbles form in the ionos ionospheric plasma. It always happened, um, it happened more often later at night, about 9 to 10 p.m. So bubbles formed on 70 to 80 percent of the nights during this solar max when they're having all these coronal mass ejections. Um, they're more prominent during the equinoxes and least in the summer. So that's some general modeling they've done. To me, I look at this and I say, this is exactly where I don't want to be flying um, at night at, on 
some, uh, spring, <laughs> the first day of spring. Now I'm just, I don't, think, I don't know how bad it is, but this is something that they now at least can acknowledge that this, this happens. You have, might have loss of lock from GPS more during these periods because of the solar activity. So due to all this, um, the military um, considers the threats on GPS to be real. Um, and they take them seriously. And the policy is that each ship and plane have two independent means of navigation. So both your, all your navigation cannot depend on one system, aka GPS. You have to have another redundant one, which is why I showed you that slide before of the Stella example where they, they had a redundant check. They also find that GPS over-reliance increases loss of situational awareness. If you're always looking down, you're not looking out the window. And they, they had, did a couple studies and they thought that this proved true, that they needed to have more situational awareness going on. Unfortunately, um, the time it takes to do celestial navigation aboard a ship is a lot longer than they have. Ship, uh, shipboard activities are very busy. They're doing a lot of different things. So when I went, I went out on a ship, um, uh, a destroyer in the Pacific, this is me, a destroyer in the Pacific, and found that what they were doing most with celestial navigation was doing a redundant check on the heading of their ship. So this here is called a Polaris, and on top of it is an Allendale. I think I'm saying that right. It's either telescopic or non-telescopic. At sunset, it's dim enough you can use a telescopic version. And what they're doing, or what I'm doing here too, is um, measuring the angle that that sun is on the horizon, on the celestial horizon. This is lined up with the ship's heading. So you're basically getting a heading of between the ship's, ship's front of the ship and the setting sun. Stella, the program that I showed you that predicts does the solutions for them, also has an option to generate the, the angle that should be at. If they're off by more than the degree, the ship has to go back to port. Because if you travel for a long time with your heading off by more than a degree, you're going to end up somewhere where you shouldn't be. So at this, I'm doing this one at sunrise. This is at sunrise, and this, is, this one is at sunset. And this one, the sun comes into a beam and you, you um, project it down. It's too strong to look at with your eyes, so you project it down onto this ring, and you can get the angle that way. So this is celestial navigation as well. It's not a fix, a, a position fix, but it's a check of where you are on that. So right as of last year, due to time constraints, this is all they were really doing for celestial navigation in the Navy on, on board ships. However, a big change happened this year. And the Navy decided that officers, I don't know if you read, uh, it was in the news recently, but um, they're re-requiring re celestial navigation education in the Navy due to this issues that have come up with the vulnerability of GPS and everything else. The problem is they did not have a lot of celestial navigation instruction. So my being at Vanderbilt helped by the fact that Peabody is at Vanderbilt, one of the best educational uh, institutions in the, actually I think it is the best ed educational institution in the United States, and they also have a very strong Navy ROTC program at Vanderbilt. Together, all of us formed a team and we created this uh, set of 13 videos uh, called Vandy Astronav, and it is a uh, course in celestial navigation. This, as of the spring, became the Navy requirement for celestial navigation for all officers, and we're very proud of this. So um, we are now educating officers in uh, celestial navigation in their intro to navigation class. The, um, each of the, this is an example of one of the videos uh, on, I guess this is on declination, but it, t it walks them through a site. It walks them through, after you get your altitude, these are all the things you have to do. This is how you find what you need in the book. And this is what page you go to. And it, and it very painstakingly goes through the whole thing to get a site. And so they can find their... After this, we introduce them to Stella, which is the computer program that does everything for them. And they say, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. But you have to let them learn the hard way first. 
and then go through. We invented this uh, site reduction form. These are the different steps that you go through. You start with your altitude, and these are all the corrections and everything else until you get your, um, your, the two things you have to plot, which are intercept and azimuth. Those are the things how you make that line. And you do each page for each altitude you take. So you have to do it three times. The Navy's version of this was very cryptic. It didn't even have plus and minus signs in it, which we're like, oh, we've got to have plus and minus signs. This is kind of the, we call this the reduction form with training wheels. And um, it's, it's been very well received so far. <laughs> so these are some stats for Vandy Astronav. Um, it's been up for about two years. And about 1,200 people have completed the course, the full course. You register for it and go through it and do all the assessment and everything else. But you can also just watch it. And we've had 50, about 57,000 downloads. Um, it was piloted at Vandy uh, Navy ROTC. It was incorporated. It took about a year to get it incorporated. I went and trained all the instructors in the Navy um, in two spots, once half of them in Pensacola and half in San Diego. Uh, these are all the lieutenants that teach navigation. So I went and trained them on it. And then now it's required at 160 Navy ROTC units. They started taking it this spring. Um, the Surface Weapon Officer School is also using it. This is the place that they go after they graduate from the Naval Academy or from ROTC. They send them to a little course before they send them out on the ships. So they're doing it again at SWAS. And then the Naval Academy actually looked at our site before they came up with their coursework as well. So that's another um, 1,200 students that are learning at the Naval Academy. And so I'll finish with this. This is my joyous moment of the day. This is the week that they started instituting it in their navigation class. And I was waiting for this. This is the blip in the user stats when they actually all the instructors were downloading it. And since there's about 160 units, I said, oh, they're, they're using it. So we were very excited um, when, when we saw it come to be and, and it's going from there. So I thank Vanderbilt for making that happen and changing the face of celestial navigation education in the Navy. So in any case, that is all I have. I'd be happy to have your questions. All right, so we have time for a few questions, and I'll pass around the microphone. So, Hi. Mic on? A little bit louder. There we go. Um, so teaching the Navy ROTC kids, um, how did they get horizon shots? Oh, how did they take sight? Right, yeah. Well, we gave them the data oh. and said, you, you, you do this. Now... I have taken sites from campus, and I'm going to do that this summer in a Maymaster class. It is okay at the precision that we're doing not to guess your horizon for educational purposes. Any suggestions if somebody wants to practice this? Oh, somewhere? gosh. Um, you, um, I mean, if you can get some water, any lake or anything like that, it's, it's enough. But, I mean, so you have to do the math to because you're not actually pointing at the horizon. Right? right, but you can visualize pretty much where the horizon is. Um, the other thing you can do is this, and I've done this, well, you can practice taking sights. You can't actually do, do a fix, but for my students, I'll just draw something on the board high, or I've gone on top of the, the, the garage at Vanderbilt, um, the parking structure, and just tried to shoot it out as long as far as I could and try to visualize where it is and then took a sun Always practice with the sun, it's the easiest one. Make sure you put your filters down, mm -hmm. but practice with the sun, and if you can start doing the sun, that's, that's what the, na the navigators use the sun more than anything um, to get sights. You can use the sun at different, um, different intervals, like maybe three hours apart, and they become three separate stars. And you can find your location, as long as you're not moving. If you're in the same space, um, you can do the sun three times w during the day, which is what they often do. you know the time. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and if you go to the Naval Observatory website, they have um, the, GHA and the, the GHA and the declination of the sun already there. It's, uh, it's, if you Google um, USNO, um, Celestial Navigation, ha they have a web page, and you put in your time, put in your location, and they'll give you the GHA 
and the deck to go through this. You can download that site reduction sheet from the Vandian Ast Astronaut site and try it out from that. Is it possible in like 50 years that we'll have different constellations than we do have now? Oh, that's a good question. Well, maybe not 50 years. Maybe a little bit longer. A couple, a couple of thousands of years, but yeah. You know, if you, go to the, if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you have different constellations too. So that's a quick way to see different constellations or different times of the year. But yeah, we are moving. Um, the, the, what, the, the direction that most of the research says is that the stars are migrating out of the plane of the galaxy. So we're all moving. So over a time period, 50 is a pretty small time period um, to see that kind of thing though. So. So um, if someone is doing this sort of thing multiple times, do you find that the errors sort of cancel each other out or people tend to screw up in the same way each time so that you're always like two miles off the same direction? It depends how your eyesight is. Um, yeah, um, I think you get better at it, but it just depends what your platform is. I mean, if you're on a ship, you know, doing this, trying Rocky and everything else, it depends on your observing conditions as well. Um, but I, th I think people do get better at it as they try it. When I first did it, I taught it, I mean, we came up with the class and we got, we were taught by um, the Naval Academy's last uh, celestial navigation teacher. He's retired and started his own company. And we went up to Annapolis, my student um, and another astronomer at Vanderbilt, and we went out on the dock and tried to do sites off the dock in Annapolis, and all of a sudden it became apparent to me, oh my gosh, don't worry about all the air, the air is me. I mean, this I, is so hard to take a sight. Mm -hmm. So even with the best conditions, the best astrometry, the best observer, you're, you're going to get three, 350, 350 meters. So. This may be a silly question, but you've got a submarine. How does the submarine yeah. get there? sightings do they do it through the periscope or do they have to surface to get they would have to their surface. sightings so there there's a whole there's a whole brand of navigation that's navigating off the, the bottom of the ocean they're taking pictures on the bottom to navigate now there is in development and i'm not speaking for anything because i don't really know but i did hear rumors about them trying to develop something to take a shot kind of like i was telling about pattern recognition to go up take a shot they don't have that right now but um, to do true celestial on the sub, you'd have to come up and take sites. Yeah. Who developed the stellar program that you're talking about, the computer program for that? That's from the Naval Observatory. So are those engineers and astronomers? They're I all mean, astronomers. They're all astronomers. Yeah, they're all astronomers and then programmers. Um, Sometimes we have to contract out for programming, but um, we do that. And then there's a, a redundant program at um, the, um, the, in the United, our equivalent office in the UK. It's called the UK Hydrographic Office. They have a, um, a very user-friendly uh, system called NAVPAC, N-A-V-P-A-K. That is for sale, that you can actually buy that program and have it sent. It's really, good. It's really slick. Ours is just for military use, but you can buy NAVPAC. I haven't heard you out of the phrase inertial navigation yet. Um, you talk about backup systems, and there's so far I've heard uh, GPS and Stella. Yeah. Uh, the destroyer that, that you were on, what other means of navigation did that ship have besides Stella? And, yeah. and, uh, and is Loran still working? No. No. There's talk about it, though. There has been talk about reinstituting Loran, um, but inertial is is a last, kind of a last resort in, in there as well, inertial. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't recall, I don't really, I didn't really have any, a lot of experience using it when I was there. Um, but I know that's one of the systems. I think they have seven total. A lot of them depend on GPS though, <laughs> as the source. <laughs> so. All right, any other questions? Oh, yeah. It's free, public. Google Vandy Astronav. And does that get into all the spherical trade? 
No, but it shows you, you don't need to know it though, because it shows you the books to go to to, um, to get the data without having to do the spherical trig. Okay. Problem with those books are they're very cryptic to try to figure out how to look things up in them. And that's what we've done is to show you how to get it, how to look things up in them. And that's for like fMRI mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, there's a link to the tables on the site too. Okay. So you can download the, the region that you need without buying all the volumes okay. of the book. So yeah, you can just download it. Is there any kind of project on underway to simplify the books? Ah. <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, no. Mm -mm. It's not. It's not. This, well, this book has been orange for, uh, I don't know, how, about 100 years probably. I mean, they, they won't change the color because the navigators are trained to recognize this. And they're also trained to, to do these tables as well. So they're very reluctant to change. Um, these books are required on every vessel in the UK and the US. Um, and I just don't know. Um, there's a team, my office in DC is, I think there's five of us now, so that's it. So, I mean, it'd be a big effort to, to try to change something and they'd have, probably have to have a really big reason. I mean, we've been around for 150 years, so it's been a lot of reason for change, um, changing this, um, this way of doing things. I think we're, 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 we're digitizing things more, so we're always offering this as the option, as a traditional option, but then there's, we're adding on the digital uh, resources now as well. So I think this is going to stay like this for a while, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question. Why are the Navy coming back celestial navigation promoted? Because of vulnerabilities. China. GPS. <laughs> well, so they're, they're going to be prepared to do celestial navigation because all the GPS is knocked out. Well, that's the hope, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, if it, I mean, if it came down to that, they're not going to be using celestial navigation for, for precision navigation. They're going to be using it as a last resort um, when everything else is gone. So if, God forbid, that happened. So we want them to have an, another method. <laughs> All right, well, let's thank Dr. Stewart. Thank you. So she will be around for additional questions.